Well, thank you, Carla, for that, that warm introduction. And I must uh, begin by invoking the name of Chris Myers Ash, who is my co author and my good friend, and who, uh, with his wife Erica, Rabbi Erica Ash, introduced me to JUFJ, and so they're the reason that I am here. Uh, and so I just want to mention them to begin. Yes. So when the folks at JUFJ contacted me a few months ago to tell me that I would be honored with the Heschel Award, my mind immediately went to the famous picture of Rabbi Heschel during the March 1965 protest in Selma, Alabama. The image is arresting, a line of civil rights icons clad in black suits and overcoats. Though they wear Hawaiian garlands of flowers about their necks, their stern expressions bespeak the danger of their endeavor. Just over one month before, Alabama state troopers had beaten and tear gas marchers as they tried to walk the same route on what would aptly be called Bloody Sunday. The violence forced marchers to turn back that day, and this was their third attempt to make the 53-mile trek to the state capitol in Montgomery. And sandwiched between such iconic figures as John Lewis, Constance Baker Motley, Martin Luther King, and Fred Shuttlesworth was Heschel his unruly white hair and beard making him instantly recognizable. Though a brilliant theologian and author of more than 20 books, many Americans outside of the Jewish community know Heschel only from this picture. And for many of those same Americans, this picture symbolizes the black Jewish alliance of the mid 20th century. This famed alliance helped to produce the civil rights breakthroughs of the 1950s and 1960s, and has shaped how we talk about black Jewish relations down to the present day. Now I should stop here and just say, uh, and give an apology to my, my black Jewish uh, uh, friends and, and those listening in the audience. Um, this is a nomenclature that we've been uh, given by history. Uh, and I'm also speaking in generality, so I'm gonna continue to use the phrase, even though it is not totally accurate. There are in fact black Jews as there are white Jews and black Gentiles. Taking the Black Jewish Alliance as my subject, I will speak this evening about the difficult work of building alliances against and in the face of powerful economic and political forces that tempt us to adopt a politics of selfishness, fear, and hatred. And recognizing that I'm here because my co-authored book, Chocolate City, I'll draw my examples from the history of the nation's capital. I apologize to the folks from Baltimore JUFJ, but Come on, guys, you guys get to vote for people for Congress. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're even here. Um, now, in these desperate and trying times, we blacks and Jews, the most liberal and loyal members of the progressive coalition, need to practice the, ra the radical solidarity symbolized by that picture of Heschel and King. Now, though I take this picture as my starting point, I must offer a warning. These canonical images of the civil rights movement, of Heschel and King and Selma, just as much as the missing person poster of Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney, can obscure as much as they reveal. Frozen in time, unspeaking, often reproduced without context, these images make the liberal black Jewish alliance seem frictionless, natural, even inevitable. Yet solidarity is never so simple. Solidarity is not charity. It is no cheap gift easily dispensed. It requires mutual risk. It requires the hard work of give and take. And in communities like our own, where we place tremendous stake in group cohesion and are ever wary of outside influence or control, it risks accusations of betrayal. Now, is Rihanna Greenberg here this evening? Yes. Okay, all right, okay, good. Um, so if any of this sounds familiar, Rihanna, that is because I'm drawing a great deal of it from your mother's book, Troubling the Waters. Uh, and so I'd just like to point out that if folks do not like what I say tonight, please blame Rihanna's mom, uh, Cheryl Greenberg. I'm joking, I'm joking, of course, um, unless you all don't like what I say. Um, so I'll begin my analysis in the early 20th century, for it is in this moment that African Americans from the South and Eastern Europe and Jews from Eastern Europe first encountered each other in large numbers in America's major cities. Despised minorities, targets of the pogrom and the lynch mob, large segments of both communities embraced the liberal values of tolerance 
and broad access to civil society. The rise of the New Deal and many in both communities equation of the Nazi regime's master race theory with, the, with American white supremacy brought these activists closer still. Many African Americans became conspicuous in their condemnation of anti-Semitism, and Jews could be found in many a civil rights organization. In Washington, D.C., this alliance was perhaps best expressed in the collaboration of Annie Stein and Mary Church Terrell. Stein was a salty-mouthed 36-year-old child of Ukrainian Jews. She had come to the nation's capital during the Depression as a labor organizer, intent on convincing black and white workers to fight together against the racialized pay scales that left both of them at the mercy of their em employers. Terrell was the refined 86-year-old grand dame of the civil rights community. She had moved to the city in the 1890s and for a significant portion of that time tried to convince white women's organizations to adopt a feminism that knew no color. The two teamed up to lead the coordinating committee for the enforcement of the DC anti-discrimination laws in 1949. Though best known for its pickets outside of downtown restaurants that refused to serve African Americans, the committee led a broad pressure campaign to force the city to enforce the lost laws, Reconstruction era statutes banning racial discrimination in district businesses that had never been repealed. And I should point out that the lost laws were passed in the 1860s and early 1870s. Uh, they had never been repealed, but the city commissioners in 1901, when they, they uh, rewrote the DC code, just dropped them uh, for their fa in, in, because they favored segregation. And so they just, without repealing them, just took them out of the written laws of the District of Columbia. The committee educated the public about the laws and the extent of discrimination in DC negotiated with local businesses to encourage them to desegregate, planned and coordinated pickets and boycotts of stores that refused to abide by them, lobbied the city commissioners, Congress and the president for legislative action, and pursued litigation to have them enforced by the courts. In June 1953, Stein and Terrell capped three years of near constant agitation with a victory before the Supreme Court in the case of District of Columbia versus John R. Thompson, and company, which ruled that segregation in public facilities in the nation's capital was illegal. In other words, the lost laws were still in force. It was a monumental victory, and they had achieved it fully 10 years before Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Black Jewish Alliance that Terrell and Stein embodied would deliver similar victories on the national stage through the late 1960s. But racial and economic tensions between blacks and Jews always simmered below the surface. While many movement activists viewed Jewish Americans as their most prominent white supporters, many grassroots African Americans viewed them as whites, who though often discriminated against by Gentiles, nonetheless occupied a higher economic and social strata than themselves in a segregated society. With anti-Semitism often relegating Jews to the edge of the white community, closest to the undesirable neighborhoods occupied by racial minorities, blacks and Jews were typically the first to encounter each other across the racial divide. As renters and landlords, shop owners and customers, neighbors in those racially uh, uh, bordering neighborhoods or uh, along those racial borders. Proximity just as easily bred love as hate. And even among people of goodwill, the Black Jewish Alliance was sorely tested as activists turn from the struggle for legal equality to the hard work of creating equality in fact. This tension could be seen in the efforts of our neighbors just a few blocks down Georgia Avenue, Marvin Kaplan and Warren Van Hook, to create a racially integrated uh, community amidst white flight. The child of kosher butchers from Philadelphia, Kaplan dedicated himself to a racially egalitarian vision of American democracy after learning about Japanese internment during World War II. He moved to Washington in 1952 to take a reporting job and within weeks was sweating on a picket line outside the Hex department store taking orders from his bossy neighbor, Annie Stein. Kaplan would go on to distinguish himself as the executive director of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, but most DC residents, particularly those from my neighborhood in Shepherd Park, know him as a co-founder of Neighbors Incorporated, a Northwest-based organization that was easily the loudest champion of integrated living in 1960s Washington, D.C. 
1957, the Kaplans moved to Manor Park, unwittingly placing themselves on the front line of one of the most jarring demographic changes in the city's history. During and after World War II, African Americans flooded into the district as part of the Second Great Migration. Between 1940 and 1960, just to give you the specific numbers, the black population more than doubled from 187,000 to 411,000. Conversely, as the city desegregated, whites flooded out. More than 170,000 moved to the still segregated suburbs between 1950 and 1960, and another 130,000 left the following decade. Seeing the opportunity to make money in the scramble, real estate agents encouraged jittery white homeowners to sell at reduced prices. They used a variety of blockbusting and panic selling techniques to stoke their fears, bombarding white homeowners with repeated phone calls and blanketing blocks with fear inducing flyers, warning them to sell before it was too late. The agents then would inflate the prices and sell the houses to African Americans. Warren Van Hook also feared the destabilizing influence of these real estate agents. A native of West Virginia, he settled in DC after a stint at Howard University, opening a pharmacy in Northeast. Van Hook and Kaplan easily collaborated on community building initiatives like garden tours, the famed art and book fair that celebrated the virtues of integrated living. But as white flight continued apace, the two struggled to reconcile their advocacy of integrated living with the desperate housing needs of black Washingtonians. With the suburbs still closed to them and the ghetto threatened by urban renewal, slum lords, and heroin, some African-American members of Neighbors Inc. began to privilege black access to housing over integrated living. In other words, they needed to get into the houses up here because downtown was becoming so dangerous and unstable. Kaplan and many white, neighbor, many white members of Neighbors Inc., on the other hand, focused their efforts on stemming white flight by recruiting new white residents to the neighborhood. Though they shared similar convictions, the black and white members of Neighbors Inc. struggled to find the best way to both serve their community's respective needs and achieve equality in a society made painfully unequal by segregation. Though tested in the 1960s and 1970s, African Americans and Jews' relationship was often defined by its most reactionary members in the 1980s and 1990s. Then, a loud contingent of neoconservatives emerged among Jewish intellectuals, principally in New York, and the Nation of Islam asserted itself among African Americans. Unwilling to work in solidarity to address the unsolved problems of a segregated society, they blamed each other for those problems. Neither group represented the majority of Jews or blacks, but their angry denunciations of the other set the tone for black Jewish relations through the end of the century. Advocates of a black Jewish alliance during these years, or just even of open dialogue, were often caught in the crossfire. Here in DC, when Mayor Marion Barry denounced Louis Farrakhan's anti-Semitism, the minister condemned him for, quote, trying to placate the Jews. Conversely, when the DC Council signed a resolution acknowledging nation of Islam, the Nation of Islam for its impressive drug fighting efforts in Mayfair mansions, local Jewish groups viewed the action as endorsing hate. Jim Nathanson, the only Jewish member of the council, found himself in the untenable situation and voted present. Today, the difficult work of maintaining the liberal black Jewish alliance, Jewish alliance is of the utmost importance. The lure of tribalism and selfish disregard for your fellow human being emanates from the highest office in the land. The Trump administration is actively playing groups against one another for political gain. African Americans are told that they will benefit economically from the crackdown on the southern border. The president has tried to cur curry favor with American Jewry by attacking progressive black elected officials and activists is anti-Semitic. Now, I've been giving you examples locally for most of this paper, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave them out here just based on good manners. But I will nonetheless say, because I saw her as I was walking up here, that I was very much heartened, uh, Councilwoman Alyssa Silverman, uh, that you expressed the type of radical solidarity that I'm advocating for.
in the face of a campaign by your opponents that tried to play off w us one off against the other. I won't say who those opponents were. <laughs> There's no question that our tortured histories have cultivated a fearful defensiveness in our ranks. We know what has happened, and we, we are ever alert that it could happen again. But at our best, we have moved beyond a defensive crouch. At our best, we have reached deep into our pain and alienation to create a vision for a better world. Call it tikkun olam, or the proclamation that all God's children got shoes. We have embraced a radical solidarity that refuses to advance our group interests at the expense of others. So in this moment, when many of our political leaders are encouraging us to be our worst selves, when the lure of tribalism is so intense, we must stand in radical solidarity against the forces of selfishness, fear, and hatred. To steady our hands and steel our nerve for the hard work ahead, we would do well to return to the image with which I began, Heschel and King on the road to Montgomery. Not the simple, easy, deracinated image, but the hard history that undergirds it. Even at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Jewish Alliance was tenuous and fraught. The activists who gathered in Selma were not dilettantes. They knew well the simmering tensions between their two communities. But they believed that this fight was worth fighting, that indeed the fight could ease those tensions, that they were pursuing a goal greater than their own immediate self-interest. As he stepped into the crisp March air outside of Brown Chapel in Selma, police helicopters hovered overhead. Rabbi Heschel must have been afraid. Violence was ever about the marchers. Though they did not appear in the more famous pictures, some marchers wore football helmets and hard hats, anticipating, anticipating another police assault. The federal government feared violence of another sort and stationed thousands of National Guard troops in the woods along the highway, fearful of a Klan ambush. When a, when a reporter asked, at the age of 72, why Heschel would put himself in such a situation for a cause that was not his own, he gave reply with words affecting and true. I must recall what is the most important challenge I face, he said, and that is realizing that I am involved in the fate and dignity of my fellow man. Thank you. <laughs>